Welcome everyone. This is the B-Weekly IPLD team call. It's uh, April the 15th, 2019. Um, first of all, I ask everyone to put his or her name in the crypt pad. I also post it in the chat in case someone doesn't have the URL. And I need a note taker. Any volunteers for note taking? Thanks, Rod. Um, okay, so um, if you haven't put in the crypt pad yet what you've worked on, please do so, or any other agenda items. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just, yeah, as I'm the first one on the list, I start with me, what I worked on. Uh, that's pretty short because I just worked on the JavaScript IPLD formats stuff, which hopefully I will finish this week. And then we yeah don't have endless discussions in the JavaScript meeting why <laughs> why I, I don't get it done, but hopefully um, I'll finish that. And then I will probably work on the OKRs uh, for this quarter on the other ones. Um, other than that, I don't think I have any news. Um, yeah, so next on the list is Rod. Yep. Um, so I did um, pull request number 110 in the IPLD specs repo. Uh, so I did a, a bit of a survey across um, some major standard libraries looking at collections and seeing looking at some of the commonalities some of the groupings where you can group these these things together and then put up some initial framing thoughts in a, a spec in a pull request there so the idea is that that pull request um it creates a doc a, a directory that is called what is it called um data structures well there, there was already one there called data structures it's now lowercase in this um, and then the main document is called utility collections and I've changed some of the um, dependency graph and the, um, the the stack picture just to generalize this idea of collections as a foundational data um, thing that we build on top of and so that document there has um, a lot of thinking about what these collections are going to be and how to categorize them into things like um, singular versus associative, so lists versus maps, and ordered versus unordered. And then some of the kinds of things that, that are common across um, programming languages because they're useful, and some of the um, operations that they commonly have. So um, hopefully that directory will soon be filling out with um, specifications for all kinds of data structures uh, that build on, on those ideas. Um, anyway. That's one thing. The other thing is um, Eric's going to talk about the schema work that he's been doing. I've been working on that as well, trying to turn it into something that is actually usable just to um, prove its utility really is the initial aim. Um, so I've, I wrote a, a grammar for it to parse it. Um, well, the current version, it's pretty raw, so it'll, it'll probably have to change. But um, the idea is to be able to get quickly get to something that can do some basic reading and writing of blocks. So read a block, transform it into the shape that's described in this in the schema, and do something with it. And um, want to connect connect it to this collections logic so that when you read a block, the block has some signifier in it that says I am this kind of collection. You need to go to this place to get the logic, um, and then it, it does a little bit of a dance with that logic to um, defer to the logic to, to, to move through the collection. And there's probably going to be a back and forth where the, the logic says, okay, I'm done with this block. I need a new one. You can get it for me and then come back to me when you've got it. So uh, a little bit of a back and forth. So I want to try and get to something at least fairly raw, fairly quickly on that um, so that we're not, you know, spinning wheels too long on this academic idea of schemas, and it's actually proven useful. Anyway, Eric, over to you about schemas. Um, 
yeah, schemas. I guess they sort of exist now since we started talking about them in earnest last week. Um, and I've been hoisting up some PRs into the specs repo finally. Uh, I think we'll still have a subset of, of all of the existing writing, but trying to like get things in some order as they go into the specs repo now. And um, thank you guys for all the comments on that. Um, that parser is also really freaking cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was just very exciting to see. Um, so, so yeah, I think we've got lots of, of interesting conversations going on there already. I don't know, broadly speaking, how it is going to be the most pleasant to navigate some of those PRs in, um, because it's it's super, super easy for any of the discussions around the data model specifications or the schemas to just like, there's a whole fractal of things that need to be specified at some point, right? And I have, I just have no idea how to keep how, how to like cleave different parts of the fractal apart in the format of GitHub issues. It's just like a skill that requires magic and I, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but it's going well so far. And uh, I, I don't know, maybe some meta discussion about that might be helpful, but I just have no idea what shape it would take. So I'm really excited about the progress anyway. And um, yeah, I guess all of that stuff is, is all I have to report. So if you've been on those PRs, you know what I've been doing. Cool, thanks. Uh, next on the list is Adin. Uh, yeah, so um, been looking at some of the, the P2P notes and seeing some of the recurring issues about like it's essentially basically we want something centralized to get them working now but we don't want to hamstring ourselves later and there seem to be like four or five issues that are all basically that um including one that looks like michael has been doing some work on so i'm gonna i, I took a look michael at your your issue too and interested uh, more about what you were thinking um and uh decided to punt on acl type behavior for dag synchronization because it's it's going to require more time than i have right now um to do that i think and so i'll just sort of do the normal you get one you get one acl for one name data structure and call it a day like ipns is currently doing and we'll figure the next the rest out later um and I'm going to try again with IPLD Prime in a week or two and uh, see how that goes. Cool. Um, yeah. Next is Michael. OK, yeah, I have a bunch of stuff. I'm like still <laughs> updating the list. OK, um, so yeah, let me, let me knock through this. Um, OK, so there was a bunch of stuff that happened in the JavaScript IPLD stack last week. Um, so I implemented browser, dynamic browser fetching of codecs. So the idea is that in the future, if you just compile this stuff with Webpack, none of the codecs will actually be in the default bundle, except for like the raw codec four lines um, and then all of the codecs will come in dynamically as you need them um, that should like really really help with bundle size stuff in the future um, and won't um, and and right now the way that works in IPFS is that users up front have to decide which codecs that they want and sort of and send them in if they want to do that kind of stuff um, and they can't get rid of any of the default codecs as well so it's a little bit limited um, I factored out all the unnecessary async operations um, in the block. Uh, the idea here is that I'm starting to implement a bunch of the performance uh, improvements that we've kind of talked about to make sure that the API model that we have actually supports all of these. Um, so that one was, was pretty cool. Um, you can look at the diff there. Uh, I migrated the DAG JSON implementation over to this new stack, which led to just a huge deletion of code. So that's definitely um, uh, an endorsement of the work that we've done to make codec development easier in, in the new um, interface. Um, this week, I'm going to move all of Unix SV2 to over to the IPLD stack stuff, and then um, I'm also going to implement inlining of select resources so that we can actually prove that out and, and show how that works. Um, 
After that, the only thing that'll be waiting on then is a HAMP implementation in order to move forward with uh, Unix 52. Like, that's the only thing that we need to hand it off to IPFS to integrate at that point. Um, it'll be mostly complete except for the HAMP stuff. Um, okay, the summit in Berlin, uh, we have finalized t-shirts and venues, so that's all coming together. This week I'm going to put together the agenda. Um, a bunch of stuff is already in this Google Docs uh, for the first two days. Haven't quite mapped out the rest of them yet. Um, last week we did, we did our final OKR scoring. Hopefully you saw that and agree with your scores. <laughs> uh, I feel the earth. So this has been coming up a lot where like we need some kind of permanent cloud store for IPLD blocks um, that is very, very simple and can host blocks on behalf of people in an authenticated way. Um, I decided to just write something real quick, quick using Lambda. So I registered a domain called IPLD.earth for it. Um, we now have an AWS account um, for just the IPLD project, so that's cool. Um, and yeah, I, I immediately figured out that um, ARC, the tools that we use for interacting with Lambda, don't properly support binary bodies and puts. So that's getting, that got fixed over the weekend and that should go out and release today and I should be able to make more progress on IPLD Earth. Um, and then I don't know quite where I'll get with that project this week. Um, all right, cool. Any other questions? Or stuff um, yep. I have a question about the uh, how does the uh, dynamic loading in the browser work? Like, where does it come from? So, do you pass in a URI yep. UI or like? No, like, no, no. So, um, so the way that this works is that if you like, use the import function, so like, have you ever used the import function before, like in Webpack or like any project compiled with Webpack? It yeah. basically it gives you a promise to the module, um, and then Webpack just under the hood will do code splitting on that. Oh, um, so basically my question is like, if I use a format in my code, will Webpack automatically bundle it? Because yeah. that's the whole point of bundling. Like, yeah. so especially, yeah. so well, then, no, no, so, 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 yeah, yeah. So this is what happens, right? There, there are like these big if defs in there. So we have to have like an if def for every codec that, that is ever possible, right? Just like we have now. Um, so this get codec module, we eventually like have like, you know, the, the, the import function statements there. And then what Webpack does is it, it goes, oh, okay, I'm going to need that, but I'm going to break it out into a separate file and load it uh, asynchronously. So what happens is that Webpack knows that these are re all these codecs are things that you might use in the future, but none of them show up in the default bundle. What happens is that it loads them over HTTP dynamically, um, and it creates like hash-based file names for all of those. So. Okay, but basically, if you if you build something with Webpack and mm -hmm. deploy it like the normal way, it will be just mm -hmm. in there magically, kind of. Yes. Yeah. Like yes. you don't have to do any. Yes. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That's, that's this was supposed to be a question. Okay. Okay. It's magic. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, crazy webpack magic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, webpack is. Oh God. Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> webpack magic. Yeah, great. Yeah, uh, yeah. but but the, the nice thing is that like uh, that import function is being standardized. So like eventually that will even be in Node and work more or less the same as an asynchronous loading mechanism. Not that you needed a Node necessarily, but it would just mean that like eventually we could not have two entry points for the yeah. files. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't realize that, that um, having a standardized HAMPT was, was going to be a, mm -hmm. a necessity for getting Unix FSv2 done. I thought, no. I guess I just assumed that, that that MFS stuff would exist as it is today. So we're, we're essentially recreating MFS here by formalizing the HAMPT or? Well, no, it's not just MFS, right? Like anytime you create a directory with like a, a bajillion files, you're going to need a HAMP. Yeah. Um, so it's actually like part of just Unix support in general. It's not just part of the MFS. And the way that this works in Unix 1 was that it was just like a one-off HAMP on Protobuf. And, and so it's like not really standardized. Um, so yeah. we need a we need a standardized HAMP on top of the data model because um, because like, you know, this works on any codec in the data model. So theoretically, you should be able to create um, DAG JSON or DAG CBOR like graphs that, that have uh, yep. Unix vests in them. Um, so yeah, so we need that, that slightly more generic um, HAMP at, at some point. Um, it's not, so it's a blocker to get it released, but we could actually probably start the integration work before we have this because the interfaces from the Unix, from, from this library side will look identical whether or not you use a HAMP or not. Because the, the way that it works is that it's just an async generator that gives you all of the blocks that you ever need for the graph. So it's just going to end up giving you more blocks for all the intermediate HAMP nodes in the future. Um, like that, that support should happen more or less transparently. So we could start the integration in, in IPFS um, before it's complete. Okay, but that does place some urgency on getting that HAMP stuff 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, want, we'll want something that works by the end of the quarter, basically. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, any any other agenda before we move on to other random things? I don't have any items, so <laughs> feel free to move on with the random yeah, things. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> so um, last week we we had this uh, schemas talk, and we also did like a small demo, like a small talk about um, agility prime and selectors for the file coin team. And they both went really well. Um, I feel like it, it gave us like a lot of really good feedback and visibility into those projects. And we have a bunch of other stuff coming down the pipe now that is just like stuff that we're finishing up and are kind of ready to hand off or, or at least get more feedback on. Um, so I'd like to turn it into just more of a regular thing. And so what I'm thinking is that we do this meeting every other week um, on the off weeks. Um, sometime midweek, not on Monday. Um, I want to put something on the calendar for basically a show and tell, and we'll fill that in with whatever project happens to be ready every other week. But we should, at least through the end of the quarter, probably have enough new things that we want to gather feedback on to use that slot. Um, and as each one comes up, we should proactively invite all the right people that we need around to, to review that kind of stuff. So if it's a JavaScript thing, we should get like the JS people on it. If it's like a, a Go thing, we should get the Go people, and et cetera. So you mean like have a generic show and tell slots and then agenda and actual like recommended attendees may vary you're right right and we may even have to move the timing a little bit to accommodate those attendees depending on their time zones cool okay awesome cool any other questions concerns um molly, I... molly was first <laughs> You okay. pointed at me on my screen, so I don't know what that. <laughs> this is where on, on my screen. Okay. I know we all we all get shuffled. Um, so I have a quick re request when it comes to IPFS camp, uh, which is coming up in June. And Michael and I have been chatting a little bit about kind of like attendance and stuff. That, you know, this is not a, a required event for for folks, um, but we are creating a lot of awesome new content that's meant to like live on past this event. So it's like very much targeted to be done um, to get everyone up, like level up during the camp. The people that are coming um, will participate, but also kind of in the future, this stuff lives on Proto School, uh, is like more available to the rest of the community and is something that would be used in a lot of other um, workshops and tutorials. Um, and so kind of there's, there's four main courses that we are planning to create and have everyone walk through for IPFS camp. Um, and one of them is kind of like the core understanding how IPFS deals with files and DAGs and all of that stuff. And so it's very much Unix, UnixFS v1 stuff, not v2, because it doesn't exist yet. Um, but uh, currently the people who are kind of on tapped to, to help us develop that particular course are Alan and Steven. We were thinking that it would be really useful to have a group of three with someone from IPLD kind of jumping in there from kind of a, a data model perspective on how we deal with files. Um, and so depending on if there's anyone who's interested in coming from IPLD land um, who wants to help us create this course, um, that would be useful. So uh, I can make an ask on GitHub or we're also like not necessarily trying to publicize all the content we're creating ahead of time so that um, all attendees already know what we're doing before they even show up, which would be a little bit of a, uh, you know, not as exciting and surprising. Um, but kind of request for, for someone on the IPLD side who has bandwidth to kind of collaborate with um, Alan and Steven to create this kind of like files level workshop um, to, to think about if you would be interested in doing that. Um, I mean, I can probably help out. I think the problem is that I actually don't know Unix SV1 very well at all. <laughs> like I put all of my time into the new one and I, I actually don't know very well like how to work with the protocol stuff. Um, that would be the only problem. But I know like how Proto School works really well, and I can help out with like that side of things. I don't know. Is, it, is, anybody, is anybody else more familiar? Fulker, are you very familiar at all with that side of stuff? Um, I know, like probably, I, like I know, like the the uh, lowest level basically, which also isn't that useful. So I miss the things in between. <laughs> But uh, but I can surely like also like help out or like if there's any like low level questions, but. Like, I don't know. Like, like I, I'm not sure if I know more than probably Ellen does, but uh, yeah, 
basically if you have file issues or ask me or I don't know. So, so I'm happy to help out. So I guess. So um, um, Michael should be probably just split it between us. So you do the high level stuff, and if you have questions, you just come back to me. Okay, that works. Yeah, cool. cool. So I guess Michael, I'll I'll loop you in from a um, like DRI ish perspective as a router of information to humans in IPLB land to to help propagate. Okay. By that, you don't mean that I'm the DRI for the whole thing, right? You just mean... No, okay. I just mean okay, okay, great, three great. of you are, are uh, you and Alan and Steven. You are the IPLD perfect. representative within that group. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Cool. Thank you. If we've, if we've got time, Michael, you mind if I, if I try and extract yeah. a little more information on this like web seeds kind of thing? Sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, the, the general problem, right, is that like, and, and this was the, a problem with BitTorrent as well, which is that you have a, a, a section of data that is in really high demand. And so there's a lot of peers available to serve that content. And then you have this big, long tail of data that's hardly ever accessed. And, so, and there's almost never peers on it. And it's like prohibitively expensive to run a BitTorrent node constantly to serve that data that only gets access like once a month. So they did this system called WebSeeds where you could basically just like, along with the trackers, right? So you have like each tracker, and then you can also just say, okay, here's an URL, and it's basically the peer of last resort. So if you can't find files like through um, any of these track for, through peers on any of these trackers, then fall back to this. Um, and it works really well, actually. It's what like most of the the web torrent people use when they put like content up and stuff like that. So um, it just dramatically reduces their bandwidth bill, um, but it doesn't you know change their storage bill, obviously, because they're still storing it permanently somewhere. Um, but yeah, it it works quite well, and we have a similar problem with some of the the partners that we talk to in in IPFS land and stuff like that. So like I really wanted to see something like that. We have a distinct advantage in that. We don't have to say, oh, here's a URL to content. We can actually say, here's a URL to box because, and you can treat it like any other block discovery mechanism like you were trying to do. Um, I, I, I wasn't being very prescriptive at all about like the mechanism by which we surface this, like, um, or how you enable it. Like, I don't, I, I don't really care. I mean, the effect is going to be the same. If somebody can build an application and say, okay, I'm going to put my data here, try to get it out of the, the the peer-to-peer -peer network, but like if not, then fall back to this, then that's fine. Um, and so your your proposal totally works for that. But you can see some of the discussion there is probably quite well. Right? Any any other yeah. specific kind of questions? Or? Yeah. Well, I was just yeah. What I I guess I got confused a little by the the CIDs thing in Base 32 because as far as I understood, mm -hmm. the current plan is that in the in the future asterisk, we're going to replace all the provide records with looking for multi hashes anyway. So, so yeah, I, I have concerns with that because, <laughs> so uh, in that case, you would just do the base 32 of the multi-hash rather than the base 32 of the CID. I think that we want it to be CID because if you, I've been, as we're sort of building up this IPLD.earth thing, I've been starting to think about what it would look like to have a service that was providing blocks on behalf of like thousands of people, potentially millions of people. So like billions of blocks that millions of people are hosting. One really important information, piece of information that helps you a lot is to be able to look up a CID and know if you also already store the whole graph underneath it. If not, then every time that you do a sync or you ask like, hey, do you have this information? You have to parse the entire graph and follow the entire graph. And so what, what a service or even honestly, eventually like regular nodes are gonna wanna do is store a little piece of metadata next to the CID that says, oh yeah, I also have like, you know, all of this data. Um, so at some point we will probably wanna make like a protocol adjustment on, on the BitSwap side to say like, hey, do you have all of the data underneath the CID and expose that same kind of thing? And if we did the same thing over HTTP, we would want it to be in some kind of a header, right? Um, and and but in order to do that, you have to be talking about a CID and not a multi-hash, right? Because the, you don't know what the codec is for the multi-hash, so you can't tell if you have all the data that you All the data, or sorry, all the data that it links to in the graph. Yeah. So that's that's why I was saying uh, go with CID. And then the base 32 is just like, we have to pick an encoding so that you can put it in the early yeah. system, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, I, part of what I was thinking is that we already have, sorry, Volker. Mm -hmm. And uh, just why, like, why do you need the the codec and not just the hash? Like, what? Why do you need the full CD information and and the codec? Wouldn't you also like 
I don't even see the relation between, you know, if you have a tree beneath your CAD or not, depending on is it a CAD or just a hash. So I don't get the... Well, because like, <laughs> because if it's just a multi-hash, you don't know how to ask it for links. So how would you be able to go and determine if you stored all the data? Underneath? Oh, when you then get the data, basically. So, so if you request the hash, but then you don't know what it actually is, what you just yeah, stored. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, got it. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess what I was thinking is that the, the DHT currently res re responds to you with these like peer info records, which are peer ID and a set of like peer IDs and the multi addresses. And if the peer ID was just like null, you would be okay. Because the multi address could just be a URL. Right? Right, right. Um, and that requires not really making anyone else who's currently running a node change their software. It just means that the people who, when you read the data, the interface not, needs to not return a peer info object, which is what I think, mm -hmm. which is what it currently does. Right, but wouldn't you, you would have to, so, but just saying it's a multi-address is probably not enough, right? Because you're gonna need to, like it's not that generic. Or, or, or are you just saying that like, okay, so for the purposes of these peer info records, if you get, a multi-address, you are just expected to encode CIDs and attach them to and like append them to it? Is that like wh what it is considered at that point? Like, I don't know, there was a thing that either you or Steven mentioned in terms of adding like, like metadata information of like where to get the rest of the blocks or like mm -hmm. what's the structure of the file. But I guess the idea was, you know, I run an, I advertise, hey, this block is available at this URL. Oh, I see what you're saying. I and see then, what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. And then okay. you just get it. And okay. You're like, okay. I think so on, on our side, we were thinking more like you just actually don't have the, TH, the DHT at all. Um, so on a node, you would say like, look for this stuff in the DHT and if you can't find it, fall back to this URL. Um, whereas this is a bit different because this is actually the record that's in the DHT. So that makes sense then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it feels like it's a little less, um, it, it is. It requires one more trip because you actually still have to do a DHT request. You can't just go hit the, you mm -hmm. know, S3 bucket directly. But it mm -hmm. still allows all the. D it doesn't make you have to do like a hard fork to the centralized world. You just sort of get to naturally flow there. Yeah, I mean, at the very least, it would be like, <laughs> I could see really easily layering in that kind of a service though, where you just say like, oh, if I got back a record with nothing in it, then I'm just going to add this record <laughs> to this URL and like try it. <laughs> um, um, we are running out of time just, uh, so we have already half an hour. So I would ask you to take it offline. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So is there anything else people want to discuss or I don't see any hands. Then uh, I will uh, close the meeting and see you all again in two weeks. Goodbye, everyone. Mm -hmm.